It is 2020. Yay. Um, each year, uh, for the past number of years, I've, I've challenged the church on a particular thing over the course of the year. Uh, one year we did fasting, one day a week. Uh, one year we did um, hospitality. And while I would encourage you to not stop just because the year is over, to, but to continue on in those disciplines, um, this year I've got kind of a different thing uh, that, that God has been speaking to me. Um, how big is God? Well, he's infinite. Um, one of the songs we sung this morning had a line in it that, that uh, he is the personification of love. I disagree. I think that's backwards. God is what gives love its meaning. Without God, we would have no concept of love. The only way we can love is because he loved. Um, I think we, in our abilities to understand God, we diminish him. Just because we're trying to fit the infinite into a finite mind. I'm sorry, I got, I got a, it's weekly. It's like a, it's like a, an addiction. Um, I think a lot of times we don't expect enough from God. Um, I think a lot of times we allow the transience, the, the frenetic pace of this life to, to diminish what we see and think and expect of God. Jesus spoke, and I know there's some differences of opinion, as to what this means but he said these things and greater you shall do um, 2020 I want to challenge you scripture says that God is exceedingly and abundantly able to do all that we ask or imagine now I want to put a little caveat in here. Scripture also tells us that we have not because we ask not or because we ask amiss. But how does that finish? That what we get we might spend on our own pleasures. Okay? Uh, this is not about, this. This what I'm telling you is not about um, getting rich financially, materialistically. It is about getting rich. Absolutely, it's about getting rich. But it's about getting rich in those qualities that God desires for us. Um, I have started praying, and I want to challenge you, not this particular prayer, you come up with your own. Uh, I have started praying that every day God would give me one person to share the gospel with. What's the date today? The fifth? I'm one for five. Now, that's not God's fault. That's my fault because I'm not paying attention. So now I've got to add to my prayer that I, I catch the moment when it comes. Okay? I don't think it's too much to expect that. I think that God is bigger than I think. Did you catch that? God is bigger than you think. And I think we need to step into that bigger in 2020. Uh, we are doing 28 days of prayer in February. There's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one, because it's good to pray together. That's, that's a sufficient reason. Another reason is because we want to lift up other fellowships around the valley, pastors, and the ministries of these churches. Because when you uh, 
put together a meeting of people to worship God, you become a target. The enemy will do everything he can to dissuade you from doing that. But the primary reason for this is because I believe, and increasingly I believe, that God has more for us at Jesus Community Church. He wants more from us. He wants more for us. And in this time of prayer, I am asking that he would reveal that to us. What does that look like? What, what is it going to be? How is it going to work in the fellowship, the family here at Jesus Community Church? Um, honestly, I have some ideas about things that uh, I believe he wants us to move into, but we are all called to minister. Every one of us. And that's part of why we're doing this series on the gifts. <coughs> so that you can understand how God has equipped you. Because remember, God does not call the equipped, he equips the called. And if God had not done so, I would not be here today. I wouldn't be standing up here in front of you. Absolutely not. So, um, my challenge for 2020 is to step into bigger. Step into bigger. What is it that God wants you to engage in? What is it that he is calling you to? Now keep in mind, um, just because God gives a calling on you doesn't mean that uh, you're not going to be afraid. Uh, you're not going to be a little uncertain. Uh, you look at Paul, toward the end of his ministry, he asked the people to pray that he might have boldness to declare the gospel. Now this is Paul who had already established a dozen churches. And he's asking them to pray that he might have boldness to declare the gospel. So, so uh, as part of that, we want to pray for boldness. Now, bigger for you is going to look different than bigger for me. Okay? So, challenge for 2020. Step in to bigger. Now, if you have your Bibles... Go ahead and open up to Ephesians 4. I'm going to touch on Ephesians 4 for just a minute, and then we're going to move forward. Uh, I would like to encourage you, uh, if you have taken the spiritual gifts test, uh, bring it next week. Uh, we will be getting into the particular gifts next week. Um, but I want to, th there's a number of passages that I want to touch on today and try and give us a solid understanding of what's going on. Next week we'll actually get into what these particular things mean. So in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we've spoken about this uh, a couple of times now. Uh, we see that God has established in the church um, elders, and we see that God has also established deacons, Men whose qualifications are exactly the same, well, one, one difference, but, but uh, the qualification for an elder and a deacon, as far as their, uh, the measure to which they are held, is the same. And we see that uh, in the body of Christ, God has given us elders who are the, the ones that are the, the spiritual um, caretakers, and we see that God has given us deacons who are the physical caretakers. Both of these are needed. Both of them are necessary. One is not greater than the other. Okay? Because in the body of Christ, there isn't greater or lesser. If there was greater or lesser, there would have been a difference in the price paid for greater and lesser. But he, he poured out his blood for all. 
So all are equal in the body of Christ as regards value. Okay? But not all are called to the same position. All right? Now, because of the, uh, the way that our minds work, um, you almost always give greater uh, credibility, greater uh, value to those that are uh, at a position that we deem higher than we do to those that are lower. And we're, gonna, we're actually going to touch on this particular fallacy in the next uh, week or two. Um, you know, we, we like to measure things. Um, for example, uh, like, like in, the, in a company, in a corporation, we like to think of uh, CEO and president and CFO and the board. We, we think of them as the important people and then, you know, the, the level of importance diminishes as you go down the ladder until you end up at the bottom, whatever that position might be. And, and these are greater value, these are lesser value. But we also do this with, with things like uh, sin. You know, there's the big sins, and then there's the normal sins, and then there's the little sins. Look, guys, there's sin. Sin is sin is sin. Even the smallest stuff separates you from God. Okay? Um, thank God for the blood of Christ that takes that away, but, but we, we always want to try and uh, ascribe value positionally. Um, I look at uh, so many ministries uh, around the United States and, and even uh, around the world, and we, we tend to uh, idolize certain ministers. Um, we, we think they have more value because they might have um, a bigger church or a radio ministry or uh, books that they write or whatever. <clears throat> and that's not, I don't mean by any means, I do not mean to diminish those men. They are serving. I, I read a story one time about a young man that was graduating uh, from college, from Bible college, and he was attending where uh, John MacArthur was the, I believe he was the president at the time. And this young man, uh, his mom and dad were coming out. This young man had uh, uh, done really well in school. Uh, he had done so well that they were going to have him and, and a number of the other students to a, uh, a private dinner with the uh, staff and the administration. And uh, he wanted to eat. He was allowed to invite a guest. And so he asked his dad, who was a pastor in a small town, had a small church, about 30 people, and that was all. Uh, he asked his dad to come. He knew his dad really admired the teaching of John MacArthur. Now, uh, I, I don't care what your stance is on John MacArthur. I have not found a minister yet that I agree with 100%. Um, so, you know, whether, whether you agree with his teaching, disagree with his teaching, um, that's, that's irrelevant. Uh, he is serving God to the best of his ability. Um, but, but this uh, young man's father didn't want to go to this dinner because, I mean, he's, he's sitting down with, with some of the great men of God, men whose names are widely known. Now, just, just real quick, does everybody know who John MacArthur is? Okay, John MacArthur is a, a pastor of a large church. He's written a number of uh, very insightful books. Uh, he has got an incredibly large ministry. Uh, but, but there's a point that I want to make to this, and if you don't understand uh, why, uh, you know, this, this, you won't understand the story. Uh, so this, this young man's father, pastor of a small church, uh, was out in the Midwest. Uh, he, he doesn't want to go because he's kind of embarrassed. I mean, you know, I, 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 I pastor a small church. And uh, his son talked him into it. His son was being honored, so he went. His son was honored in the course of the meal. After the meal was over, as people were uh, mixing and mingling, uh, John MacArthur came over, and the young man wanted to introduce him to his father. And so uh, John MacArthur asked him what he did and asked him a little bit about his ministry. And 
then John MacArthur said something that was really, uh, I think had a great deal of humility and insight. Uh, he looked at this young man's father and he said, I envy you. I envy you. He said, I miss the days when I knew everyone in my fellowship. I knew what was going on with each family. I had personal interaction with each person in the fellowship. He said, I envy that. He said, things have gotten so big and not, this is not to diminish uh, the ministry of John MacArthur and where God's taken him by any means, but, but he's, he said, uh, you know, he's, he's got so much going on that he doesn't get the opportunity to just get out and meet the, the congregants of his fellowship. He doesn't get to interact with them to a great degree. He's been somewhat isolated from that as he's moved into other things. Now, before you start judging one or the other as being better, they're not better or worse, they're different. Okay? They're not better or worse, they're different. All right? Um, this young man's father went home with a, a, a renewed uh, fervor for his ministry because he understood now, and it took John MacArthur to open his eyes, he understood the value of the ministry to which God had called him, okay? Um, who would think that John MacArthur would be envious of anyone, but he envied this man, <coughs> the opportunities that his ministry gave him, okay? So, Ephesians chapter four, um, I'm going to back up a little bit to verse 1. Uh, we're going to read down, uh, and I just want to kind of tie this thing off real quick before we move into a couple of the other passages. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He is uh, in prison. This is one of the prison epistles. Um, verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, you can take this in one of two ways. Um, both of which are appropriate. First, you can look at this as a call that is general. Okay? Uh, we have all been called by God. Okay? Every one of us has been called. As a matter of fact, at Calvary, God called all men. Scripture says that God desires that all would be saved. Okay? That not one would perish. So you can look at it in a general sense that God has called us and we have responded. Okay? The Holy Spirit has given us everything we need to respond to that call and become the children of God. But you can also look at it in a little bit more of a personal manner. What particular thing has God called you to? Uh, underneath the umbrella of salvation, underneath the umbrella of grace and mercy uh, and faith, there's, there's different areas for us to operate in. Okay? Um, so you can look at this in a general manner, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Now think about the calling. The price paid for that calling was the blood of the lamb. So we already know that the calling is of great worth, of great value. And, and yet um, we are still called into it. All right. So generally we're all called. But specifically, we're all called to different parts, different positions, different places, okay? Um, so, uh, walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Wow, we could do a whole message on those two verses. Um, but we'll, we'll do that at another time. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of of peace. Um, I, I'm, I, no, we'll, I'll pass that. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. 
Now, this seems kind of weird for where we're going, but I think we need to understand context. Context is everything in Scripture. That's why we don't ever take one verse, pull it out of the, the verses around it, and build a theology on that without understanding the context in which it was used. All right? Um, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, um, Paul, being the master of parenthetical statements, in addition to run-on statements, um, in verse 9, he inserts something here uh, that has led to quite a bit of confusion in the church. Uh, he says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Um, no, I'm not going to talk about that one either. But I'm sorry. I, I, okay, uh, verse 11. Okay. And he, being Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Now, We've talked about this verse. I've explained to you the different call of each of those. They're called to a specific ministry. Um, right now, I am fulfilling the role of a teacher. Uh, I also, in some manner, fill the role of shepherd. Um, we have other people that have been called to different positions. This statement here, these gifts right here, um, I believe these are positional. If, if you will, you can call them uh, body ministry gifts. Uh, these are positions that God calls people to as compared to the other ministry gifts, the spiritual gifts uh, that we'll, we'll touch on later. These are positional. Okay? God calls someone to fill a role, a particular role. Okay? Now, not all of us are going to be called to one of these particular roles. Okay? I, I think what, what Paul is trying to establish here is how God has orchestrated the church body to work. The uh, ecclesiology, the, the, the running, the setting up and the running of the church. Okay? Now, we also understand from what we studied before that in, in these positions we have elders and deacons. Uh, we look at some of the elders uh, that were called. We, we see a number of the apostles. We see Paul. We see Barnabas. Uh, Silas, uh, but we also see some of the deacons, and, and foremost among the deacons was Stephen, um, who gave an incredible testimony. Um, but we can't stop right here, because Paul is, is telling us something significant, and so many people will stop right there and spend all their time on, on these gifts. So if you back up to, to verse 8, um, we see that uh, the, the word used there, uh, Paul says uh, that he gave gifts to men. Um, the word used there is domu, and it simply means gift. Okay. Now, How many people know what the term charismatic means, specifically in the church? Put your hands up, okay? Don't be, don't be, don't be shy. It's not a bad thing. Okay, so, so what, is, what is the charismatic, what does charismatic mean? Yeah, that's, that's actually, in the English, when, when you say somebody is charismatic, it's somebody that people are drawn to. I think Jesus was incredibly charismatic. I think um, I think Jesus had the most incredible eyes. Okay, I I, I don't think they were blue. <laughs> I think they were brown. Um, but I think when he made eye contact with you, things inside you changed. Um, in the church, the charismatic movement, uh, charisma is actually a transliterated word from
from the Greek uh, charismata, and, and it simply means gifts. Now, the, the, this gift is used in a different manner of speaking than the one that we have here. Uh, domu simply means gift, but we almost always see charisma or charismata almost always used in connection with pneuma. Does anybody know what pneuma means? And it's not some silly song that a guy did on YouTube. <laughs> that was just for Thaddeus, because he watches that guy. <laughs> <laughs> pneuma. Um, we, we, uh, anybody know what pneumatic means? What's pneumatic? Air pressure. Air. air. Pneuma is from the Greek, and it means air. Pneumatikos would, would mean like the stirring of air or the, the action of air. But used in context, it also means spirit. Okay? And when you see uh, pneumatikos used with charismata, you have spiritual gifts. Okay? And so the charismatic movement in the church are those people that have uh, embraced the pursuit and the use of the spiritual gifts. Okay. Now, uh, I grew up in a charismatic church. Okay. I absolutely believe that the gifts are for today. Unfortunately, there, there was a, a place, and there still is a place, where people have, have taken... Uh, the charismatic part of the movement, and, and quite honestly, they've become charismaniacs. Um, they have, no, now it, it, it might sound a, a funny phrase, but they have taken the gifts of God and they've begun to worship the gifts rather than the God. Okay? And and uh, in, in their misapplication of Scripture and their, their um, unwillingness to accept all of Scripture in the context in which it was given, uh, all of a sudden, the gifts become more important than the fruit. And we're actually going to see in several of these passages, going over the spiritual gifts, that, that they are juxtapositioned next to fruit. Okay? Ah. Um, all right. So let, let me wrap up today with this. This is kind of our intro to next week. Next week, please bring your spiritual gift surveys. Uh, if you don't have one, let me know, and I'll shrug my shoulders with you because I don't know where they went. Um, they used to sit back there on the table. I don't know if they're back there somewhere. Steve, do you have any idea? Have you seen them floating around? Okay. Um, if you um, don't have it, let me know. I will try and get you a copy. Um, understanding our spiritual gifts, how God has given to us particular gifts, how God has equipped us, will help us understand how God wants to use us. Okay? Um, God has not given me a, a mechanical mind. I understand the rudiments of of a combustion engine. I understand why it does what it does. But when you pop open the hood and there's 500 other things in between you and the engine, I just close the hood back down and call someone that knows. Um, I am not gifted in that, therefore I'm not a mechanic. Okay? Um, so if, if you're in trouble, your car's not working, call me, I'll come pick you up. <laughs> and then we'll call someone that knows what they're doing. Okay? So I, I want to encourage you this week. There's a couple of passages I want to give you. Um, I want you to read over them. I want you to read them in context. Okay? Meaning you got to back up before and you got to read after. Um, Romans 12. I want you to read Romans 12. Pay particular attention to verses 6 through 8. Those are the, the, those are the verses that we're going to spend some time on. But I want you to read why he's talking about these gifts. Okay? Then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, I want you to read before and after. Uh, the particular verses we're dealing with are 4 through 11. But I want you to back up, read 
why he is talking about this and read after so you can fit it in the context of what Paul is trying to say. Um, and then finally, I want you to read 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, the particular verses are 10 and 11. Again, please read them in context um, so that you can understand what's going on.